Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. Today's topic is Asian American history, or that's the major theme of what we're going to address. And I do want to thank the Idaho Humanities Council. It's through their gen uh, very generous uh, financing of wonderful presenters that we are able to have our guest today. I welcome to the program Priscilla Wegers. She has a very distinguished background. She holds a PhD in history from the University of Idaho, received in 1991. And she is an independent historian and historical archaeologist uh, specializing in history and archaeology of Asian Americans uh, in the West. Uh, she's worked in many parts of the world dealing with um, archaeological studies and adventures in Idaho, Washington, Oregon, California, uh, England, New Zealand, and Belize. Uh, our guest is the founder and volunteer curator of the University of Idaho Asian American uh, Comparative Collection. Uh, Priscilla, if I may call you Priscilla. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank sure. you for being with us. We appreciate thank it so you. very much. And we're very privileged to have three panelists today to question our guest. Uh, first of all is Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho. And next to her is Judith Meyer, who is uh, a very successful businesswoman and also on the Board of Trustees at North Idaho College. And the third one is Erna Reinhardt, who is Director of Public Relations at North Idaho College. And Janelle will commence today's questioning. Welcome to our show, mm -hmm. Priscilla. Y you are involved with the Asian American Coll Comparative Collection. W from now on, we're going to call it the AACC, <laughs> yes. the Asian American Comparative Collection. And can you tell us, what is that? Uh, yes. The Asian American Comparative Collection, or AACC, is a collection of um, artifacts and bibliographical materials that are important for the study of Asian Americans in the West, um, particularly in the Pacific Northwest. I started the collection in uh, about 1982. A couple of years later, we added a little newsletter that goes with it. So we've been doing this almost for 25 years now. Uh, we have people coming to study the collection, often students or faculty members, um, but we have people from um, other parts of other walks of life, um, government employees and so on come to use it. What are some of the kinds of items that are in the collection? Um, we have a collection of mostly re items related to the early Chinese in the West and some related to the early Japanese in the West as well. And so we'll have um, household materials such as um, ceramics, um, utilitarian wares like um, jars for uh, food and so on, or table ceramics, bowls, uh, plates, spoons, that kind of thing, medicinal items, um, smoking materials, particularly items related to opium smoking because that was legal in the United States mm -hmm. until 1909, and a variety of other miscellaneous materials. And those would be mostly related to the Chinese. And then things that we have related to the Japanese include the utilitarian materials, uh, table ceramics, and um, so on. Well, this show goes out to a large area, and I know there are mm -hmm. many people out there who are interested in this particular kind of thing. Mm -hmm. What can they do if they would like to come see it? Uh, they can contact me. I think the telephone number is going to be given on the screen and make an appointment. Because I'm Let me just interrupt oh, that. Oh, sure. Put up on the screen now, and you can go ahead and tell them both the website and the telephone numbers, right. if they'll do that now. Please. And I have an email address that is, uh, if you get to the website, then you can find my email address and, and the telephone number as well. Okay, and um, okay. Would you, you repeat that? What's up there now? Oh, yes. Uh, my telephone number is area code 208-885-7075. Um, the website is www.uidaho.edu slash capital L, capital S, slash capital AACC slash. Hopefully we'll do that again later in the program. <laughs> right now we'll get you to tell about some of the other things that are interesting, and I'll ask Judy Meyer if she would uh, ask a question. Oh, thank you. There's so many questions, Priscilla. Welcome. It's fun to work with you again. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. We discovered each other years ago when I was was uh, participating in the University of Idaho tour about 
uh, Polly Bemis, mm -hmm. who's one of the folks I think you've discovered more information about than we had originally. Mm -hmm. And was it through the American, Asian American AACC A -A collection that you discovered Polly? Did you know about her before? And it, tell us about it. Yeah, it was. It was through that because, um, well, partly I started out my dissertation that uh -huh. I completed. I, I completed my dissertation at the University of Idaho in 1991. And my topic was um, the history and archaeology of the Chinese in northern Idaho, 1880 through 1910. And this was from Latah County north to the Canadian border. Mm -hmm. And it was a massive tome, hundreds of pages. Is there that much Chinese history in there? Oh, there was, but you yeah. never would have known. It uh -huh. was because I read every issue of all the local newspapers from 1880 through 1910. <laughs> to find out just putting all the little tidbits together to make a complete story. And of course Polly, because she was in Idaho County, was not part of my research. But it was only later that, um, I don't know how many of you know um, Professor Carlos Schwantes, who yes, is yes. the author of many books about Western history, mm -hmm. and who is no longer at the U of I, but when he was, he sent a student to me because she was going to be doing her term paper on the Chinese in Idaho and uh, he wanted me to help her find some background yeah. material. So um, I did do that and then I asked for a copy of her paper when she was finished. Well, her paper was on the Chinese in Warren and she had, uh, had a little bit on Polly Bemis in there because Polly was from originally from Warren after she moved to Idaho. And uh, she had interviewed her uncle, um, a gentleman who was a boy when Polly was in Warren. And he, and there, at the time, all I knew about Polly was the myth that she'd been won in a poker game by the man who later married her, Charlie Bemis. So in this student term paper and the interview that she had with her uncle, he said, and this is almost a quote, okay, Polly wasn't one in no poker game, end quote. And then he went on to tell how he'd interviewed an elderly gentleman and he, who said that the story was made up and he thought he knew who'd made up the story. So yeah, that, mystery. yeah, <laughs> that got me started. And I thought, well, you know, everybody involved is now, of course, deceased. Could I find out the, the truth about her? And I, of course, I knew about the book, Thousand Pieces of Gold, uh, written by Ruth Ann Lum McCunn. It's beautifully written, a biographical novel, but a biographical oh. novel mm -hmm. is fiction. Okay. <laughs> so Oops. could I find out the real story? And so that's what has started me out on the research. I have uh, my book, Polly Bemis, a Chinese American Pioneer, that I wrote for fourth grade and up because students start studying Idaho history mm -hmm. in the fourth grade. And then I have another longer article in Wild Women of the Old West, edited by Glenda Riley and Richard Etchulane, a longer article on Polly. I also have an article on her husband, Charlie Bemis, called, that I called Idaho's Most Significant Other. <laughs> and that was in Idaho Yesterdays uh, in 2000. So I've been compiling this material for quite a long time. And my, my next project, after I find a home, a, publish, a publisher for the book I've just written on another topic, my next uh, project is to write the book, the complete biography of Polly and Charlie Bemis for adult readers, fully footnoted, so you'll know where I got all the information. <laughs> Erner Reinhardt. Thank you, Paul. Before we go on to another topic, I want, I want, I really want you to set the stage for all of our viewers about the story about Polly Bemis and what it was like in the late 1800s on the Salmon River in the Gold Rush. Tell us what that was like. A little bit about Polly's story. Yes, um, please. Polly came to Warren in 1872 from China. And all we know is that her parents sold her because they had no food. And then she was brought to, she says, brought to Portland where she was sold for $2,500 to an elderly, an old Chinese man who put her on a horse in a pack train and brought her to Warren. And in Warren, um, she must have been purchased, we don't know for sure, but she must have been purchased by a wealthy Chinese businessman, and we suspect as his concubine. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it was not customary for Chinese, wealthy Chinese men who had concubines to share them with anyone else. So I do not believe that Polly was a prostitute as some people say she was. Um, so from 1872 when she arrived until 1880 when she is listed in the census as living with Charlie Demas, we know nothing about her in that intervening time. And that's where this story has come that Charlie won her in a poker game. Okay. Um, and she is in the newspaper, occasionally in uh, newspapers and other documents um, for some time until their marriage in 1894 and then they went and settled on the Salmon River. Uh, they took up not a mining claim, well it was a mining claim not a homestead. And uh, they worked, uh, they were there with that and uh, in 19, um, I think it was about 1924, he died. Uh, their house burned down and then they went across the river. 1922, sorry. And the house burned down. They moved across the river and stayed with a couple friends and then he died later that, uh, in October actually, and they buried him on that side of the river. And then friends took Bet Polly back up to Warren and she lived there for another couple years while the same friends rebuilt her cabin. Mm -hmm. She moved back down and then she was there for another 10 or so years. She got sick, was taken out to Grangeville, and died in Grangeville, was buried there. No, that's not the end of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> because um, in the 1980s, some, the people that then owned the property wanted to restore her cabin um, and have it as like a little museum. And so at that time, they had her exhumed from the cemetery in Grangeville and returned to the property and buried on her side of the river, across the river from her husband, who is buried at what is now the Shep Ranch mm -hmm. on the other side of the river. And so she is buried at the Polly Bemis Ranch? She is buried at the Polly Bemis Ranch, and her husband is buried across the river from And can her. people visit there? Yes. Okay, it's open to the um, public? Now, it's... Um, the only way to get to the Polly Bemis Ranch is to either take a jet boat from Riggins up the river or to float down the river. Those are the two main ways that people come. It's also possible to take a plane to the Shep Ranch and then take a little, just take a boat across the river. Great, thank you. But for the public purposes, because I've done that tour, I just, it's such an exciting and I think an uh, interesting mm. tour, and, and you helped lead one one time. Mm -hmm. But although you're not leading tours now, unless you happen to float by like we did or you know somebody in a jet boat, right. how does the public um, get to such a... The tours were offered through the University of Idaho, and uh, they have a program of, um, like, enrichment. And mm -hmm. uh, the name changes. I can't remember exactly what it's called now, but we have a number that we can put up on the screen. Mm -hmm and tell you if you want to get on the list, if we offer the class again, which I think they might do when the interest in Lewis and Clark mm -hmm. dies down and we're ready to look at other things again, other people in history. And I think that there'll be a lot more interest. I know there's a lot more interest because of my book on Polly and uh, the, other, uh, the other work that I have done on her. So we've never had a problem. It's taken some time to get the classes filled but we've never had a problem in actually, we never had one canceled because we didn't have enough people. My question has to do with the other book you referred to, uh, Wild Women uh -huh. of the Old West. Uh, and although this program is emphasizing Asian Americans, and particularly uh, Miss Bemis, uh, we had a wonderful director of drama here by the name of Tim Rarick, and he's also wrote plays. And he wrote a wonderful play on Mae Hutton, who oh. was not Asian American, but uh -huh. uh, she was a fascinating woman who came to Shoshone County. So my question to you is that uh, in that book and in, in the other work you're doing, uh, could you share a little bit more with us about uh, people like Polly Bemis and May Hutton and others uh, in, a, in a pioneer time, in a rugby time, how did they succeed the way they did or how did they survive or, or compare them with uh, life today and, and the role of women today? Mm. Um, well, I think that these women were very strong personalities they stood out. I mean, Polly, for example, came, she came to the United States without knowing English, with no prospect of ever going home. She did not even speak the same dialect of Chinese that the other Chinese people here did. And she was from the north. And so she would have spoken Mandarin or some dialect of uh, some tribal group. And uh, the people that were mostly in the west at that time when she came in 1872, 
spoke Cantonese. And so she would not have been able to communicate with them. Had she been able to read and write, which she could not, um, the, the writing is the same, but the pronunciation of those characters is entirely different. So she adapted herself. She learned English enough to communicate well, and um, she cooked in the American style. She wore American type clothes and so on. I think people, I think women at that time did a lot of adaptation to the male world in order to get along. And uh, I know she certainly did. Thank you. Janelle Burke. What you're doing is just fascinating. And it's, it, it's very interesting to all of us. Now, I know you're also familiar with what was happening to Japanese Americans during the Second World War and mm -hmm. some of the internments. And so can you enlighten our viewers a bit about what your study is leading you to learn about that? Mm -hmm. subject. I can. Um, my research on Japanese Americans in the Northwest has focused on Idaho's Kuski internment camp, which was on Highway 12 between Lewiston and Missoula, Montana. And the Japanese who were there were helping build Highway 12. They had taken over from a previous prison camp that was at the same location, a federal prison camp. And the Kuski internment camp had no relation to Minidoka, which was a war relocation authority camp in southern Idaho. Now, the differences between the two, that the Kuski camp was an Immigration and Naturalization Service camp, or INS camp, and it had some relation to an INS camp at Fort Missoula, Montana. Um, what happened right after Pearl Harbor was that the FBI picked up many Japanese men who were aliens and had, but they were permanent resident aliens in this country. Often they had wives and children who were citizens, but because of racist U.S. laws at that time, people born in China and Japan were not allowed to become naturalized. So these people, it's, uh, right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, uh, and the FBI had been keeping track of aliens because they knew that war was coming. And so they were keeping track of D Italian, German, and Japanese aliens. Uh, and so these, m many of these men were picked up, ripped from their homes and families right after Pearl Harbor, put in jail. Often the families didn't know what had happened to them. And then they were sent like to Fort Missoula in Montana or Bismarck um, in North Dakota. Um, in the meantime, then, so they're, they're having little hearings for them, but the hearings aren't fair and impartial. You can't have an attorney. And uh, so, and any little thing would be used against them, like they had been in the Japanese army in 1900. Um, they might have donated 50 cents to the Japanese Red Cross, that kind of thing. So very, very small things. So in they, these men are being then moved around the country. They went to, some went to like Louisiana, New Mexico, um, and there was a big camp at Santa Fe, New Mexico. All right, in the meantime, if they were from the West Coast, their families were being incarcerated in the War Relocation Authority camps. Well, first of all, in the um, so-called assembly centers, just a euphemism for another temporary <laughs> detention camp, and then in the other. So I, I personally, and I'm following the lead here of other scholars who are differentiating between these two experiences of the first, the one, the men who were taken away and interned, and second, the families who were taken away and put in concentration camps. Now, many people will say, well, you can't use the term concentration mm -hmm. camp because that can only be used for Hitler's death camps. Well, I would argue that those are death camps or extermination camps. And then that would leave the term concentration camp free to be used for the families as opposed to the men who were interned, which was internment often happened to aliens in time of war. If we're at war with their country, the aliens could be interned. Now, what was so awful about what happened to the Japanese in World War II was, of course, that we were also at war with Germany and Italy. But it was the Japanese who were easily picked out. I mean, you couldn't look at any of us and say, are we German or Italian, so let's lock us up. No. Um, but a Japanese person was 
um, easily identified. Before we go on to Judy for the next question, I want to introduce again that Priscilla Weggers is our guest. She's at the University of Idaho, and she's an expert on Asian American history, among other things. And with that, Judy will ask the next question. And could also, we want to list again the, the uh, phone number and website for the, the Pali Bemis tours and or your website of more information about the mm -hmm. Asian American collection, just because as, as we go along here, uh, folks are only going to get teased by this, and so they have other places to go <laughs> to find out more. To finish up on the Kuski camp, that is my sure. understanding there's, there's no evidence of it anymore anywhere there. Um, there's very little evidence. Um, there is, um, it's at Canyon Creek mm -hmm. on the Locksaw River, but the sign that once said Canyon Creek is now gone. So in order to find it, you have to go continue east on the road for another half mile to a campground called Apgar, A-P-G-A-R, mm -hmm. yeah. because that's where the families of the um, guards and so on live. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there now to show uh, mm -hmm. What you know, the how, little houses are all gone, but it's Apgar Campground. When you find that, then you backtrack half a mile or so, and it's the first dirt road on the right, and that goes into where the camp was. There's very little left. There's no interpretive sign. Um, several people are trying to persuade the Forest Service that an interpretive sign would be a good idea. Um, and maybe when they don't have to concentrate on Lewis and Clark anymore, they'll <laughs> talk about, think about getting a sign. Well, and so part of what you're doing is helping educate us mm. and bring to light a whole part of our history. And certainly mm. here in Northern Idaho, where we're interested in diversity, and certainly thus this group in women's issues and recognition of women, and Tony mentioned earlier, some of these women have remarkable histories that you're helping tell that story. Mm. Another part of your helping to tell the story has been that the Humanities Council has funded various speakers, in this case you, to come here to northern Idaho, further north from Moscow, <laughs> to the Rathdrum Library today, yes. and so yes. we folded you into your excursion, because you are in fact then able to speak to different groups to tell more of, of your story. Right. And in fact, I would want to highlight to our viewers that by contacting Humanities Council and learning of their programs each year, there may be ways for groups to have access to you mm -hmm. to come tell more, because we'll never get all the stories told <laughs> at this time. And you see, when I get going, I keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, for bringing all these stories to us. I think uh, for me, the question probably then is, today, what key things do you want to be sure to highlight to our audience uh, of issues you'd like them to have a chance to go explore more or you think they should be aware of or that you're working on so we can learn about them. Mm -hmm. uh, well, besides uh, the Polly story, and I do want to stress that some things that are <coughs> thought are believed about Polly mm -hmm. are not really true, like m many people think that her name was Lalu Nathoy, but there's no evidence for that. And mm -hmm. um, many people believe that she was one in a poker game, but she denied it right before she died, you know, things like this. Um, then th another thing that I wanted to bring out is that the Asian American Comparative Collection, or AACC, at the University of Idaho um, does not have any funding from the state of Idaho or any funding from the University of Idaho. And we do a tremendous, or I personally do, a mm -hmm. tremendous amount of outreach through telephone, website, email, and so on. And uh, I, I do this as a volunteer. And I'm also trying to have a business on the side. We have a small endowment that has been started, but we would like to get this up to over a million dollars. And then the interest income could be used to hire a person to do this on a full-time permanent basis and pay them benefits. This is not a position that the, it's not an unfunded mandate because <laughs> I started it, but I want to see it continue. And there are, we have many supporters but they're in the $25 a year <laughs> variety. We need a, you know, a $500,000 or a million dollar supporter to help us carry on after I'm gone. Thank you. Erna Reinhardt. Thank you. <laughs> Priscilla, I want to ask you a little bit about your line of work because it's very <laughs> fascinating, very interesting. Tell us what a historical archaeologist does. Okay. Um, as a historical archaeologist, and I'm doing much less of this now, but I've gone... Um, I've worked for, for example, um, the Bureau of Land Management or the Forest Service where they will have um, an archaeological site that has been identified already that's being threatened by mining or development or um, roads or people, as they, as they call it, pot hunting, uh, illegally digging for artifacts and so on. And so they will hire me to have an archaeological excavation there and then I will hire people or obtain students or make it possible for volunteers to help 
and then we will go and have an excavation that will do mitigation. You can't possibly um, excavate a whole site, but you do mitigation on part of the site and then you extract the, uh, the maximum amount of information. Publish a report, which we do, and then curate the artifacts um, at the university. And how would someone get into that line of work? Um, the uh, mostly it's through education. PhD. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but masters there are a lot of masters degree students. For example, the University of Idaho has an anthropology department that prepares students with masters degrees to work on these sorts of projects. And uh, with a PhD, then you actually direct the project and so on. But didn't you mention volunteers? Hmm. Are there ways for, there are ways for volunteers? volunteers. And um, there's a great program that run by the Forest Service called Passport in Time. And uh, people can volunteer to work on archaeological excavations on Forest Service projects. And I've had a project in um, Oregon and a project in Idaho that have used Passport mm -hmm. in Time volunteers oh, awesome. through this program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're just running out of time, but uh, we have like 30 seconds. Uh, of all those projects you've done, what uh, other than working on the polybemus, what's the most exciting thing you've done in your work? Um, I, well, I suppose it has to be, you know, e the project that you're working on at the time, <laughs> and which is the Kuski internment camp. And I am so fascinated by that. I had, uh, and the longer I work on it, the more I find. I had a gentleman contact me through the website because there's information on the Kuski internment camp there. He sent me a copy of his father's diary that his father wrote in English. Another man whose father was a guard there has uh, produced his father's, his late father's, photograph album. The photographs weren't taken by the father, but the father had this. And so these are going into the book. And if I'd done the book three years ago, two years ago, I would not have this information. And people contact me all the time, family members and so and on. You, you encourage that. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> yes, I do. Um, on, that, <laughs> on that note, we have to end the program, ladies and gentlemen. Our guest has been Priscilla Weggers, who is at the University of Idaho, and she holds a PhD in history, and uh, she is an expert in archaeology and certainly Asian American history. Uh, Priscilla, it's been a pleasure having you here, and good luck on your work. And, and I want to thank the Idaho Humanities Council once again because of their generous contributions, you were able to come to North Idaho. And you're leaving here to go out to uh, Rathbun to do another presentation, and uh, you're a wealth of information, and we'll have you back at some future time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed the program as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you, and we invite you to be with us again next week at this same time when we'll move to yet another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest-running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Music